it's Jesus I really want to see Oh yes, it's Jesus I really want to see that we really want to see. Well, isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Yes. How many of you enjoyed service here last night? I believe Brother David about got those walls of Jericho tore down, don't you? Amen. Praise the Lord. What a, what a wonderful service. What a wonderful message we heard here last night. So glad to have you in the service with us today. Glad all of you are here. Glad, that most of all, that the presence of our Lord is going to be in our midst today. How many of you know that we have to have him in this service to make it a service that it ought to be? Do you believe that with all your heart? Somebody say praise the Lord. Why don't you turn around and shake somebody's hand. Greet him in the name of the Lord this morning. Tell him you're glad to see him in church. Play it, brethren, if you will. prayer request. Certainly want to pray for all those that are traveling this weekend on the road. The meeting's taking place all over. Uh, may God bless those brothers that, that are ministering. Our, our pastor, I believe, with Brother Fred Mullins. and May God bless those folks. And a lot of meetings, different places. Just pray that God will pour out His Spirit in those meetings. 
and the people will be blessed. This is a testimony from Brother Kirk and Sister Martha Sacker. It says that their daughter Harmony became violently sick last Sunday evening with various symptoms. But the mighty God came on the scene and healed her. In two hours, she was completely well again. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Here's another testimony. Let me give you this, Brother Bill Yance. Some of you may know, some of you may not know, but he is able to actually eat food now. So somebody say praise the Lord for that. Hallelujah. Amen. Talked to Brother Ed, Ed Yance last night. He had some cataract surgery done, and he can see so much better. He wants to praise the Lord for that. So thank God for touching our brother back there tonight, this morning. Here's a prayer request that says, that says, please pray for Sister Sean Williams. She's the mother of two children who is in desperate need of a job. She lost her job due to false accusations. Also pray for Brian Duncan, who was put in prison because of the same false accusations. They both are serving the Lord and need a miracle in their lives. Well, the Lord knows all about that need. We're just committed all unto the Lord. Ask God to help in that situation. Brother Daniel Barclay wanted us to remember Brother Samuel Shuffler. He was here in the service last night. I don't even know what happened to him, but I noticed he looked like he was uh, had a cast and this on his arm. And uh, But anyway, he's, he's weak. He's resting this morning. They're going to be going down to Brother John Horniak's service this afternoon, just asking us to pray for Brother Samuel that the Lord would, would just touch our brother. Brother Terry Horn sends this update on Sister Julie. They tested the lung by clamping off the tube, but it would not stay inflated. They feel the tubes in the lung cavity is hindering the lung. They will remove the tubes tomorrow. Pray that all will be well. Thank you so much. So we just commit that to the Lord. Ask God to be mindful of her situation. You have an unspoken prayer request, something you'd like for this group to pray about. You believe we're serving a God that's bigger than all of our problems? Certainly we do. Let's stand this morning, if you will. Brother Matthew, why don't you come this morning, if you will. Lead us to the Lord in prayer on behalf of these prayer requests. We just commit these things unto the Lord. We're, we're so glad for what God has done in our midst, aren't we? Amen. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you, buddy. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be in your house this morning. Just an honor to be in your courts. I want to come before you with thanksgiving and praise. No one that you're the only source that we could go to, the only one that we could look to for these answers, for these petitions that have been put before us this morning. And Lord, we don't come upon our merits. We come behind the blood, come asking for your perfect will, Lord, for each one of these needs. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And we believe that we shall receive what we ask for. We ask for deliverance this morning. We ask for your perfect harmony with your word, Lord. And we ask that you take this service, Lord, and come and break the bread of life, Lord. Come in, in a way, Lord, that's only that you can speak to us. We're not many in number this morning, but Father, you said wherever two or three are gathered together in your name, that you'd meet with us, Lord. And we're coming upon that basis today, Lord. Behind your revealed word, Lord, where there's a, a lamb upon the blood, Lord, and it's all provided for, Father. We thank you for these things this morning. We thank you for the privilege to serve you. We just ask you to meet each need. And we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Matthew. God bless you. Ushers, if you'll come at this time, we'll receive the morning tithe and offering you give us unto the Lord. If you're a visitor here with us this morning, we certainly want to welcome you. Glad to have all of you here. I'll never get this name right. But we've got a family here from Ohio. It says, please welcome the Fedekiv. Did I get that even close to right? Where are you folks at from Ohio? Would you just raise your hand? Right back here. I, I'm sorry if I butchered your name, but we're glad to have you this morning. Give them a nice hand. God bless you. Uh, all of our visitors, God bless you. We're so glad you're here. Let me make this announcement. There's going to be a wedding Philip Priest and Ruth Krause 
on October the 5th, 2013 at 11 a.m. The wedding and the reception will be located at the Tipton Haynes uh, Farm over here on South Rhone in Johnson City. Due to limited seating, please sign up on the sign-up sheet in the library. It will be first come, first serve. So please remember that. That wedding, just a few weeks off, but you need to sign up if you're going because of the limited seating arrangement that they have there. So remember that. Let's sing a song this morning. We have some great times down here in church. We have some great times when we're with family and friends. We have some wonderful times in fellowship and with God and God's people. But we ain't seen nothing yet. What will it be when we get over yonder? Meet with the saints of old that's gone on from years gone by. The, the, the great heroes of faith that we're going to get to see, Brother Rob. What will it be when we get over yonder? We can't even imagine it, but it's going to be good. I promise you that. What will it be when we get over yonder and join the throng upon the glassy sea? We'll meet our loved ones and crown Christ for Him. See the 
the face oh, thank of you, Lord. Jesus. Thank you, Father. Before whose image other loves oh, all yes, Lord Jesus. Now, I know you sing it a lot, but we got to sing it. This seems like this is just the season for this dove leads the lamb. It's just the right season for you to sing that song. You wrote it how many years ago? A long, a long time ago. But this is the time we need to hear it sung. And we're going to help him, aren't we? The dove leads the lamb. Aren't you glad you've been clothed with his righteousness? Give the Lord a big hand clap of praise this morning. The Spirit and the Bride are saying, Come. Will the elect to be in stir inside their heart? Because are you not? Clean and from it. 
was granted to her. She's been washed in the blood of God's own Son. And with righteousness, not her own, she's just before His throne. Well, she's gone. Let you be seated this morning. We're going to go right on into the service. I want you to sing me a song this morning. That's what you get for not being here last night. You got to pull triple, triple duty this morning. But I want you to sing this song for us when it's my time. We're going to gather around that throne when it's our turn. I don't know how long it'll take some of us. Who cares? Time won't even be accounted for then. But when it's our time to gather around his throne and thank him for eternal life and for keeping us while we was in Satan's Eden, he kept us. Aren't you glad you're being kept? Aren't you glad something is keeping you? Praise the Lord. Give him one more hand clap of praise this morning. <clears throat> Sing it, buddy. Brother Eric, put the words up on the screen and everybody help me. I don't have much voice, but I've heard them say to do things right, one must take their time, that in a hurried pace, there's often a waste with no sense of reason or rhyme. But when I think about my Living in my brand new home The first thing that comes to my mind Is my time at the throne And when it's my time I'm going to take my time To behold His face my time I'm going to take my time to talk of his amazing grace I'm going to thank him for the love that he bore and not leaving me alone when it's my time I'm going to take my time at his throne Imagine millions upon millions. Can't you see him standing in line, just waiting for one moment or more of my precious Savior's time? And when I finally reach his presence, I'll take a thousand years, maybe two, just to thank Him for His wonderful love and His grace that brought me through. Oh, when it's my time, I'm going to take my time to behold His face. When it's my Take my time to 
to talk of His amazing grace. I want to thank Him for the load that He bore and not leaving me alone. When it's my time, I'm going to take my time at His throne. Oh, when it's my gonna take my time to behold his face when it's my time i'm gonna take my time to talk of his amazing grace i'm gonna thank him for the love that he bore and never leave Amen. How many just believes that this morning? When I get my chance at his throne, I don't want to be interrupted by nothing. I don't want to be interrupted. We won't be interrupted by phones or text or email. But when we get our chance at his throne, I want to express what he's meant to me. I thank him for every day that I was weak that he lifted me up. Every day that I was sick that he healed me. Think about what you'll do when you get to that throne. Oh my, what a great time lays ahead for us as the bride of Christ. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'm going to invite you to the scripture, the Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, I want to look at verse 36 this morning. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 26, I want to look at verse 36. We'll read down from there this morning. We'll give you our, our subject. We'll pray and let you be seated. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. Amen. I just love those old songs. But Louie talked about old songs. I like old songs. Some of those old songs, it's got a lot of meaning behind it. I know today they like them 7-Eleven songs. You know what that is, don't you? About seven words and they sing it 11 times over and over and over and over again. But I like them old songs. Them have got some meat and potatoes behind it. Something good. Something to stick with you. Amen. Something you can sing about from years and years later you're still singing about it. Amen. How many just needs a word of encouragement this morning? How many just feels like a balloon sometimes? You get deflated. You just need filled up. Well, I trust he just feels us this morning. Then come at Jesus with him to a place called Gethsemane. And said unto the disciples, sit you here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. So tarry you here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now watch what he does next. And he cometh unto the disciples, and he finds them asleep. And he said unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me just for one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. If Jesus says the flesh is weak, the flesh is weak. So he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Watch verse 43. And he came again and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again. And he prayed the third time. Aren't you glad that you know Jesus prays about something more than once? <laughs> And he prayed the third time, saying the same words. That sounds like me. And then cometh he to his disciples and said unto them, Sleep on now. Take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand that the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And then he said, Rise and let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Let's just bow our hearts. What I'd like to speak on this morning is the world's greatest battlefield. The world's greatest battleground. 
Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, with all of our hearts. We are thankful that you've allowed us to be able to be assembled together this morning. And Lord, we just look to you in the promises of your word. Lord, you know every need in this building. Lord, you know every heart. And we're asking that you would take your word, Lord, and by your word, may you scan us and search us this morning. Lord, I ask that you would come and help us to be able to yield ourselves to you. Not just me, but each one that has come. Lord, we pray that this service, Lord, that something would be said that would be edifying to us. Lord, we're living in a wicked age. We're living in a wicked time where there's pressure all around us. There's problems everywhere we look, Lord. There's problems in our homes, problems in the church, problems in the world, problems in our nations. We are just looking to you knowing, Lord, that you are the answer to every need that we'll ever have. So we look to you this morning and pray, Lord, that you would come among us in a great way. May you take, break the word to us as you did many years ago. And when he broke the bread, their eyes come open. May our eyes come open this morning to the word of life, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you this morning. You may be seated. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. I want to read to you this morning to get our hearts going a certain direction in the scripture I want to read out of the message, Desperation, 1963 is where we'll get our, our subject from. Also from the message, Communion, 1957. Brother Mel makes some of the remarks we're going to look at. But he makes this statement in Desperation. And he says, Our dear Lord Jesus himself, in the world's greatest battleground, the world's greatest battleground, Gethsemane, he cried out in despair, should he take the sins of the world or should he just remain on earth with his beloved disciples? What he wanted to do. But watch his humility. As he humbled himself, he said, not my will, but thine been done. He humbled himself to the word and the promised word of God of heaven. And notice then, he went a little further. If he went a little further, how much more ought we to go a little further? And notice the scripture says here in the Luke that he prayed earnestly. Brother, sister, if Jesus had to pray earnestly, how much more have we got to pray earnestly? If Christ, the God of heaven made flesh, had to pray earnestly, then how much more that we sinners, saved by grace, pray earnestly? If the decision throw the Son of God into despair, what will it do to you and I? Desperately, we must cry. We understand this moment in Gethsemane is unlike any other place that we would read in the scripture of Jesus' life. In this place in the scripture, the passion of this moment so captivates me and I'm amazed by what I read here in Matthew 26. I'm amazed at how that Jesus is able to divide and separate divinity from humanity. And we see that this thing that's going to take place as we have been taught about in the scripture over and over again for years and years. This is where Jesus' life had come. This is why his ministry has been sent for and has been brought to. And now it brings Jesus to the greatest place that he would ever be in his life. The greatest moment that would ever take place. After all the miracles that Jesus had done. After all the people that had been touched by the ministry of the Lord. After all the things that Jesus had, had done and had prayed and had said. After all the teaching that had been done. After all the things that had amazed the people that Jesus would speak to. Not only was Jesus, we, we, we see, not only is Jesus our Savior. Not only is he our Redeemer. But Jesus is also our teacher. Amen. A lot of people want Jesus as Savior. They want him as a miracle worker. They want him as a healer. But Jesus is also our teacher. We can take his life and be taught by what the man, the human, the humanity was able to do. And we see here is Jesus and how he comes to this place in his ministry. And you know, it's, a, it's amazing to me after all the great things that had been done. How that I would so have loved to be able to sit and hear Jesus preach the gospel. How amazing that would have been. To be able to sit there and hear his words. And how that he presents things and says it in a certain way. 
A way that no other preacher has ever said. Do you believe that? A way that no other teacher has ever said it. Oh my, how I would have loved to be able to hear him preach. I would have loved to be able to stand there at the tomb of Lazarus when Jesus walks to that tomb in his little small frail body and then he moves his shoulders back and begins to speak to that tomb, to a body that was dead inside that grave and to see Lazarus come out of that grave dressed in those great, I would have loved to have seen that. I would have loved to have seen Jesus be able to take and speak to the wind and to be able to speak to the water. You talking about a powerful preacher, a man that can stand on the bow of the boat and speak to wind and speak to water, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen and water and hydrogen obey what Jesus says. You talking about a powerful preacher when the wind obeys what a man says. When the very water of the world that had been created by the creator of heavens and earth stood on the bow of that boat, that water had to give way to the words of Jesus. I would have loved to stand there and watch him as he takes him from his tired body from preaching the meetings and how he stood there and the people were scared to death. But yet Jesus knew who he was. Hallelujah. Jesus knew who he was and he stands there and speaks the word to see him take as a boy would come into a camp as he has skipped school that way. And as he moves into this camp, he takes that little Snoopy lunchbox and takes out some bread and takes out some fish and begins to multiply that bread right in his hand. I would have loved to stand there and watch as that bread materialize when he breaks one piece off and another piece appears. And he breaks another piece off and another piece appears. I would have loved to have seen that I would have loved to have been there that day that when Jesus walked by that fig tree and that fig tree was not producing fruit like it's supposed to be producing and to see Jesus speak to that fig tree and he cursed the very roots of that tree and that tree began to wither away. I would have loved to have seen it when Jesus went to the wedding that day and he breached down into that water and he turned the water into wine. I would have loved to have been there. I would have loved to have been identified with it. I would have loved to have seen it. And the reason we love those things is because that's the divinity of the Lord Jesus. That's something we we can't relate to. We can't relate to take bread and multiply it. I've never done it and I doubt you have either. We can't relate to a God that allows the wind and the water to obey. But to hear those things, we love to hear it preached. We love to hear it preached about and talked about. There's been many sermons that has been wrote about the divinity of Jesus. It's because the divinity of Jesus is the very opposite of our lives. It's the opposite of what we do. It's the opposite, but yet we long for it as creators. As sons of God, we long for that position. We long for that authority of the word of God. We long to come to that place that the wind has to obey us. As Eve spoke that day in the garden and when Adam began to speak to that wind because it was the desire of Eve. I'm amazed at the power of God. I'm amazed at the, how that God can do things the way he does it. But really what we need help with is not the divinity of Jesus. But I submit to you what we need help with is the humanity of Jesus. Everybody loves to preach about feeding 5,000. Everybody loves to hear about the great healing campaigns. Everybody loves to hear of the signs and the wonders and the miracles. And as long as Jesus was doing those things, the crowds was following him around. The crowds followed. They loved. As a matter of fact, they was there to see the miracles done. They was there to see the signs and the wonders performed. They was there to see Jesus lay his hands on people that's crippled and they get up and walk. They're there to watch Jesus lay his hands over on blinded eyes and those eyes would just come open at the very creation of the creator. That's why the crowd was following him. They wanted to see signs. They wanted to see wonders. They wanted to see these things. But there come a time, hallelujah, in Jesus' ministry where all of that was going to take a back seat. What would happen next would be different than anything he had ever done. 
What would happen next? Well, it's going to be taking a man whose eyes sockets is there with no eyeballs. And Jesus would take mud and wipe it in the man's eyes. And he would create eyes out of mud. That's not what Gethsemane's about. Gethsemane's not about miracles. It's not about signs. It's not about wonders. It's about humanity suffering. He come to this place in his ministry, the place of Gethsemane. And when you come to this place, and every one of us, no matter how long you serve God, no matter how long you believe this message, every one of us will have to go through a Gethsemane. Gethsemane is not a place of shouting. Gethsemane is not a place of great things taken. Gethsemane is actually a place of separation. Woo. People will not stay for Gethsemane. Crowds will not be gathered for Gethsemane. There's not going to be hundreds and thousands of people lined up to see Gethsemane. Gethsemane has no attraction to it. Oh, but let me tell you, if you are a true disciple of Jesus Christ, you're going to stay with him through the thick and the thin. Whether it's signs and wonders or miracles, you're going to be there no matter how, what's taking place. You're a true disciple and you're following him no matter what. Too many people serve God out of circumstance. Preach Brother David. As long as everything's going good, we believe God. As long as everything's going fine, we're in revival. As long as everything is doing the way we think it should be going and everything's been said the way we think it should be said, we are happy. But let me tell you, brother and sister, we must serve God more than just circumstances. What will you do when the enemy turns your life upside down? What will you do when you face the greatest trial of your life? How will you overcome during those times? People want perfect circumstances. We can shout with the best of them when God's pouring out the blessings. We can lift our hands and praise God and thank God for it whenever the blessings is coming out. But let me tell you, what are you going to do when great trouble strikes your life? What are you going to do when you face the trial, the Gethsemane of your life and you don't have nowhere else to turn and it seems the heavens is like brass and you can't get an answer from God? At that time, brother, what will you do then? We are a God. We love God because of circumstances sometimes. Amen. You know what I hate? I hate false presentations. Don't you? I hate looking at something that's being advertised to be this, but when you actually get it, it's something else. Have you ever went through a drive through window and you're going through that drive through window and you look up there and you're trying to decide between the cheeseburger and the salad and you know you need the salad but you want the cheeseburger and you look up there and man, that salad looks so good and the lettuce looks so fresh. Everything looks right. Man, those tomatoes on there, they look so fresh and so raw. Man, they are just perfect. And how they got a little bit of dew dripping off the pieces of the lettuce and you're thinking, man, that's what I'm going to have. And you pull around to the drive through window and they hand you a bag out the window and you take that bag and you open it up and you take the lid off that salad and it's brown and you pick up the tomato and they have given you the very end of the tomato and you're looking at this salad and it's dry there's no more on it you know why it's not presented as it was advertised I'm afraid that we have presented this gospel to look so good and so pretty. Too many preachers are preaching a pie in the sky and a by and by. They're preaching no trouble, no problems, no trials, nothing going wrong. But it ain't the way my life is. We fight hell every day. We fight sickness and trouble everywhere we look that are coming against us. In the garden, there's no crowds. There's no masses of people. There's not 5,000 to be fed. In the garden, there's no one to be healed. But when Jesus comes to the garden, we comes to the garden alone. Alone. You may argue that the cross was the greatest moment in all of history. And I dare say amen to that today. The cross was amazing. 
It was on the cross that my sins was paid in full. It was on the cross that my debt paid. It was actually canceled because of the cross. It was there that every hope of every believer become eternal because of price that was paid on the cross. It was at the cross that every curse was broken. It was there at the cross that the sin was actually defeated. It was at the cross that justice collapsed itself into the arms of mercy. Where did it happen at? The cross. It was at the cross that the priest become the lamb. Is at the cross. But let me submit to you. The cross was settled before the first nail ever hit Jesus. Think about it. Before there was a crown of thorns put on his head, there was already a decision that was made. The cross was conquered before he ever went to Pilate's hall. That the cross had already been conquered. Where did it become conquered at? The greatest battleground the world has ever seen. The greatest battleground, it is not Iraq. The greatest battleground, it's not Afghanistan. The greatest battleground, is not Syria. The greatest battleground for you and me is Gethsemane. The cross, the cross wasn't settled on a tree. Oh God, that's good. It wasn't settled on a tree in public display for everybody to see. I got a reason I'm saying that. Because the struggle of the will of God for your life, it isn't settled on a public display of power. Hallelujah, somebody. But our struggle is settled in our private gardens. In our private gardens is where our troubles are settled at. It's in our private gardens. It's where we submit ourselves to the will of God. It's in our private gardens. It's where everything finds a way to overcome. Is in our gardens. It's in our private gardens is where we wrestle with God's will. Oh, not me, Brother David. Oh, yes, you and me. We wrestle with him. We talk to him. We talk back to him. Well, not me. I never do that. I do. Because there's things I want answers to that I can't get answers to. And we're saying, God, why did you allow this? Have you ever asked the question, why? Lord, why did this happen? Why did that happen? Why did this take place? Why did that take place? Listen, friends, God knows what you need to go through to bring the best out of you. It's in the garden that your will and is actually combined and settled to let his will be done. It's in the garden that we ask God, why don't you speak to me? Why don't you say something to me? Lord, why have you gone this long without doing something for me? Why have you went this long without giving me some leadership? Why have you went this long without speaking those still, those still small voice? I long to hear that voice. I long to hear those words. What do you hear that? It ain't in the great healing campaigns. It ain't in the midst of shouting. It's not in the midst of miracles. It's in our gardens is where we hear it at. It's in our private moments. It's during those times that all of our fancy prayers are put behind us. All of our these and our thous, preach Brother David, is laid behind us. And we swap our Rima language for reality. You ever seen some people pray, man, they, they get up there, they want to say, man, I can pray like none other, and I can say the words just perfect, how I articulate my words so good. Listen, friends, when you get in the garden, you're not worried about who hears you. You're not worried about what words you use or how people think how pretty you can pray. When you come to the garden, you come to the garden alone. It's real. It's just you and God. There ain't no show to be put on for nobody. There ain't nobody watching whether you raise your hand or not. There's nobody watching whether you worship or not. There's nobody watching you to see if you're entering the service or not. When you come to your garden, it's just you and God. God looking to you and you looking to your God. 
That's where we come and say, God, my tank is empty. Lord, I feel like I have run plumb out. My joy is gone. My peace is gone. God, I need you. And if you don't come through for me at this moment, I don't know what I'm going to do. God, I need you right now. I know you've done things in the past. I know you've done things for me. Great things, Lord. But I need you worse right now than what I've ever needed you before. It's in our spiritual gardens that we become like Jacob of the Old Testament. It's where we begin to wrestle with God. And we say, God, I need you so bad. And you're wrestling. What am I wrestling with? Why is it so hard? It's because you're fighting your very own humanity. You're fighting your very own mindset. You're fighting your own theology that lays up in your head. And you wrestle with it just like I wrestle with it. Just like Jesus wrestles with it. Just like the prophet wrestled with it. You, like Jacob, begin to wrestle with those wheels. Even though it's so painful, it's at those moments that divinity and humanity begins to fuse together. Jesus didn't just give us a picture of divinity. He gave us a picture of his human part. The flesh of a man. The humanity of a man that would suffer. The humanity of a man that would cry outside the city on top of a hill that would weep. A man that would cry over Jerusalem. A man that would walk to a grave and cry at the tomb of Lazarus because his friend had died. That's not divinity. That's his humanity. Hallelujah. Because he knew us and he knew If all we saw was the divinity and the miracles and the great things and the signs and the wonders, that's something I can't relate to. I can't relate to just a Jesus with all power. I cannot relate to just a Jesus that walks upon the water. I can't just relate to a a Jesus that would cleanse a leper and a leper going running down the street doing the Watusi. I can't relate to that. But when you talk about a man struggling with his own self. When you talk about a man that has a will of his own to be able to make a choice. When you talk about a man that's in desperate need and needs something from God, that's something I can relate to. God, let us see something we can identify with. I know how we are. We rejoice around the miracles. There ain't ain't anything greater I love to preach on than to preach about the miracles of what Jesus done. We love to read about Jesus healing the sick, raising the dead. But I'll tell you, friends, what I need to look at is how human he is sometimes. Amen. I need to look how loving he is. I need to see how he cries. I need to see how compassionate he is. Listen, church, it's in the garden. There ain't going to be no walking on water. There's no more healing the sick. There's no display of great power where people is awed by what he does. But it's here at Gethsemane. I feel my preacher coming on, man. It's here at Gethsemane. It's really what you really are. Oh, friends, how I would love for God to come in this service this morning and pull back the mask of our humanity. Pull back our our pretty smiles and our long hairs and get right behind those masks and lay all of that aside and get really get real with Jesus for a few moments and let him know I'm a real person that's got real needs and real troubles. We come to church and sometimes we come here and we put a display on, but really, who are you? What are you going through when you sit on that pew? What do you listen to? What do you hear when you hear the word preached? I pray God would get behind our smiles and our long hair and dig down into our hearts to who we really are. Brother and sister, we've come too late just to come to this building and play church. Hallelujah. You can't sit here and be a pretender. Listen, days of pretending is over. The days of make believing in the church is over. We are here to prove who's really got the goods, who's really going to fight when it's time to fight. I say to you this morning, it's in your Gethsemane that proves what you really are. Amen. Gethsemane means the place of pressing. It's the place of squeezing. That, that's what Gethsemane means. It means 
the place of constriction. The literal meaning, guess how many meaning? An oil press. That's what the name Gethsemane means. It's an oil press. It's an oil press. Not a miracle press. Amen. An oil press. At Gethsemane, history says there was a large number of great bats and olive trees that surrounded Gethsemane. Gethsemane is the private place that Jesus would go to to have personal time between him and the Father. I'm told in Gethsemane, as history says, they would have great round bats and they would take the olives and even grapes and they would pour it into that press. And then what would happen is they would even take great bastards and be able to take and squeeze those olives or they would actually get into the bat itself and begin to put them underneath their feet and crush them olives and crush them until finally all the oil runs out of that grape. Listen very closely. Putting pressure on the olive forces the oil out of it. Amen, Brother David. Putting stress on the olive. Hallelujah! Putting stress on the olive forces the oil out. Constricting the olive. Constricting the olive with such pressure. With such pressure forces all the oil that lays in the skin of the olive. Oh, glory. All the oil that lays under that skin lays in that olive. And they got to press it to get it out of it. Where at, Brother David? The Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane. I asked my wife, I said, if I ask you, how much does olive oil cost? What would you say? I wonder what would you say this morning? Some would say three, some would say four dollars, right? Maybe three dollars for a bottle of olive oil. Four dollars for a bottle of olive oil. I don't know. I don't shop much. She don't like sending me there anyway. I always buy too much. Because if I figure if we need one gallon of milk today, I'll just go get go ahead and get two, so I don't have to go back. But I said, how much does olive oil cost? And I said this. Why would I ask you how much olive oil costs? Because if I really want to know how much olive oil costs, shouldn't you ask the olive? Shouldn't you ask the olive? Because the olive is the only one, glory to God, that knows really how much it costs to get the olive in that jar. Only the olive knows what it feels like to be crushed and squeezed to get the olive oil out of it. And Jesus comes to the garden alone. He comes to a place of constriction. He comes to the place of the press. He comes to the place of pressure. He comes to the squeeze. It's the hour of the squeeze. Why? Because God's got to bring something out of him. That's some oil. It's going to have to get poured out in this Gethsemane. No crowds to see it. No miracles. No healing campaigns. No discerning the hearts. No telling somebody what's wrong with them. Hallelujah. Listen very carefully. No spirit of God on him. No spirit of God on him. He come to the garden alone. Rising the sun, 1965. The spirit left him in the garden of Gethsemane. In the garden of Gethsemane. It didn't leave him at the cross. It left him at the garden. He had to die. Man, again, adoption. Brother Ram said in the garden of Eden, in the garden of Gethsemane, the anointing left him, you know. He had to die as a sinner. He died a sinner, you know that. Not his sins, but mine and yours. Jesus had to come to the place to get squeezed. In order to bring glory, Jesus had to be pressed. Because God knows the greater the pressure, the greater the treasure. God knows how much pressure to put upon us. Listen, friends, that's the reason why you should warn every enemy of your life. You should tell them, 
thank you for putting pressure on me. Come on, church. You should send them a thank you card because the pressure they're putting on you is just bringing oil out of your life. You should say, thank them. Go ahead. Keep on talking about me. Keep on talking about me. Keep on Facebooking about me. Keep on tweeting, you little tweeter. Keep on chirping, little bird. You're bringing glory out of me. You want to talk about me? Go ahead. You want to run me down? Go ahead. You're bringing great oil out of my life. Because you see, the more pressure you put on me, the greater the oil God presses out of me. And by the way, this ain't my first garden. This ain't my first rope. Come on, somebody. I've been, I have been through pain before. I've been through trouble before. I've been through trials before. I've been in this garden before. I've been here enough to know that if he was with me then, he's gonna be with me now. I know if he didn't leave me then, he ain't gonna leave me now. I know if he was there in the days gone by, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's right here present today. I say at three in the morning, he's there. I say at two in the afternoon, he's there. I'm telling you on your lunch break, he's there with you. When you're crying out, when it's just you and God alone, he's there for you, my brother and sister. I say squeeze on. I say squeeze on. Because I know whether I say that or not, he's going to squeeze anyway. Uh -uh. I don't ask God for troubles. I don't ask God for trials. I don't even ask God for tests. Don't look at me strange. I'm sure you don't either. How many of you woke up this morning? Say, God, I wish you'd send me the nastiest test there ever has been. Lord, I want something that'll buckle me, plumb down to my knees where I think every friend in the world has left me. Lord, I want to be pressed. Uh-uh. I don't pray that. And never will pray that. Because that's not my desire. But I know, because I know, whether I pray it or not, he's going to let it happen anyway. He's making gold for the kingdom, brother and sister. I said he's making gold for the kingdom. He knows in order to make good gold, you got to be put for the fire. He knows in order to make good gold, you're going to have to go through some beatings and some tests. Squeeze on. Squeeze on. Because I know when all the squeezing is done, I know when all my guessing is over and all the pressure is done, I know that no weapon for and against me is going to prosper. I know that greater is he that is in me than he that is in my trouble, he that is in my sickness. Seth is greater in me. All I can tell you is as Paul did, if God be for us, who can be against us? If God's for me, tell me what trial, what pressure, what squeeze, what Gethsemane. Where's it happen at? In the garden. Did you know the Bible is a story of two gardens? That's all it is. It's a story of two gardens. The Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane. In the first garden, Adam took a fall. In the second garden, Jesus took a stand. In the first garden, Adam, listen, Adam hid from God and God had to sought Adam. But because of the second garden, Jesus Christ emerged from the tomb and he come looking for me. In the first garden, there was a man because of a tree caused man to die. In the second garden, because a man made a decision, he went to a tree and won back the rights of every son and daughter of God. Oh, dear friends, I tell you, because of Gethsemane, Jesus went to a tree to give every son and daughter of God everlasting life inside of your hearts. It's because of a tree. It's in the garden. It's in the garden that the will of man superseded the will of God. Think about it. But it's in the, it's in the garden that the will of man got superseded by the will of God. This time it wasn't man overriding God's will. It was God overriding man's will. 
It's because of the garden. Because of the garden. Friends, I know there's things about this we don't like hearing, but the persecution is the only thing that can bring God's glory out of you. It's not how many worship songs you memorize. It's not how many quotes you know. It's not how much of the Bible that you can quote. Friends, it's when you get pressured and squeezed by God. It's the attack on your life that brings the oil out. It's the attack on my life that brings the glory out. Anybody can worship and everything is good. Can we not? If you can't come in this church when we're singing and worshiping and put your hands up, there's something wrong with you. Listen, friends, it's easy to come in here when you got this many people praising God. You can let your hair down for a little bit and lift your hand. But what about when you come to the garden? And there ain't nobody to pat you on the back. There ain't nobody giving you an attaboy that you can make it, that you can overcome it. And you come there and you're by yourself and you're being squeezed and you're being pressed and you feel like you ain't got a friend in the world. That's who you really are. Real glory is expressed when there ain't nothing going right for you. And it feels like hell's moved into your house. Can we get real for a minute? Just lay your little message, church, all that aside, just for it, and just get real with God. When you know that there's hell in your home and there's trouble everywhere you look and the bills are piling up and the credit card debt is there and you don't know what you're going to do, God is pressing you. And most of these things are not trials from the throne. It's usually stuff we do to ourselves. Jesus comes to the garden. He prays three times. And now he knows he's never done nothing wrong. He's never done nothing wrong. He's never sinned. He's never drunk alcohol, as we'd say. He's never went out and done things wrong. He's a perfect lamb. But being a perfect lamb, God had to reverse the curse from the original garden. And now he comes to this garden to win back the original garden. God. Brother, don't you realize it was in the garden of Gethsemane that the garden of Eden after the millennium can be restored because of what happened in Gethsemane. There's no millennium without a Gethsemane. Let me preach to you a minute. There's no millennium without a Gethsemane. Amen. It's at Gethsemane that the will of the Father has got to take over. Brother Ram said in conferences in our hurry. Let's go to another one's called Gethsemane Conference. Terrible conference. Watch Brother Ram's words. He didn't have to die a young man. He didn't have to do it. Again, he said came, he came to Gethsemane and Father, the Father had to check up to see if he really Wanted to go through it or not. Again, Jesus brought himself to a decision. Before going to Calvary, the father brought his son into a conference in Gethsemane. And while the angels were taking their, their position to see what decision would be. Oh, it might not have been this way, but let's just think maybe it was. I can hear him say, son, do you desire to go to Calvary? There's a band waiting on you. There's persecution. There's death and murder laying in the way. There's even exposure of your own body. They'll strip the clothes off of you. They'll beat you into a pulp. They'll put a crown of thorns over your head. You will die screaming for mercy. What's the question? Should you go on? Should you go on? Should you go on? Jesus is in the garden wrestling with what he should do. He's only 33 years old. He's only 33. We say he's got his whole life ahead of him as we would look at him. As a man, he's just young. But the choice is his. It's a decision. I said it's a decision. He comes to the garden. He brings three people with him. He knows there's something ahead of him. He knows there's something waiting for him. He's got something, Brother Ram said, it's weighing on his mind. So he comes to this garden and here, here he's going to fight. There's going to be a war between his humanity and his divinity. Jesus is in the garden 
you got to see the picture. This is the whole point of the sermon. He comes to this garden. The disciples are here. And here are Jesus as they come in. Jesus asks us, the disciples, just pray with me. Please, just pray with me. Just pray for an hour. Just pray with me. Watch. Pray. And the Bible says Jesus went a little farther. So here is the disciples on one side. Here Jesus goes a little further to the other side. Jesus goes there and he kneels down and he begins to talk to the Father about what his will is. Listen now. The will of God was Calvary. The will of God was nails. The will of God was thorns on his head. The will of God was to be beat. The will of God was to go there and be public, put in public display of shame. That is the will of God. Listen, the will of God was not going to move. God was not changing his will. His will was Calvary. So Jesus comes and he's praying to the Father what his will would be. Lord, what would you have me do? And God tells him the will is Calcutta. The will is for you to take and to be carried outside the city and crucified on the town's garbage dump. That is the will of God. Jesus bumps into the will of the Father. And the will of the Father doesn't move. So as a man, as a man, he gets up and he goes back to humanity. Come on, somebody. He comes to lean upon humanity. And guess what? Humanity fails him. Humanity is asleep on him. He needs them to pray. He needs them. He wants to lean on them. He wants to get something from them, draw something. But when he leans to that humanity, humanity is not a leaning post. They're laying down asleep. And Jesus says, can't you just pray with me just for an hour? Just for an hour! Watch him pray! It's the hour of temptation! Jesus leaves humanity. Goes back to divinity and he starts praying Lord what is it the will of God ain't moving don't misunderstand me the will of God is not moved by tears it's not moved by his suffering I want you to hear that it's not moved because you feel bad it doesn't move because you might be depressed he was oppressed he was suffering in his body and the will of God was not moving can I say it? It's not going to custom fit your life. The will of God doesn't custom fit what you're going through, how you feel, trying to make you feel better. The will of God ain't moving. So he prays. He prays. And he gets up because the will of God's not moving. And he goes back to the disciples. And humanity again has failed him. Don't you understand what I'm telling you? When you try to depend on it and you try to lean on it and you think you got a little something and you try your best to lean upon it, it'll fail you every time. Glory! Peter, can't you just watch? Can't you just watch? Don't you realize what I'm going through? Peter would no doubt wake up, Lord, I'm I'm sorry. It's just, man, it's just, it's so peaceful here and it's so relaxing here. And man, it's just, I I can't hardly keep my eyes open. I don't understand it, but a spirit of sleep has come over me, Lord, and I don't know how to get out of this. Peter, just watch. Watch. Pray with me. The Father, listen, friends, the humanity is asking humanity, just pray with me. Just, would you pray for me? Would you remember me when you pray? Why is he saying it? He's in desperation. He's desperate. He's desperate. He knows what lays ahead. He's so desperate. He goes back. Oh, no. Please, no. Oh, God, no. He goes back to 
the Father's will. Or if you changed your will, has your word changed? He knows better. I said he knows better. Has your will, how many times do we do it? Has your will changed? Has there, is there another way? Is there a way around this, Lord? Do, do I got it? Yes. Yes. There's no Calvary without a win in Gethsemane. Believe it or not, there would have never been a Calvary unless he'd won the battleground in Gethsemane. The only way around this is to have a kingdom without a Calvary. That's the only way around it is to have a kingdom without Calvary. But guess what? A kingdom without Calvary doesn't involve you and me. It involves one man without sin. It tears me up to think there's only one man. Jesus is praying. He prays so hard. The Bible says his water and his blood separated. Hematridrosis takes over his body where literally it's a, it's a medical condition where he's put under such pressure, so much pressure, so much pressure that blood literally pours from the pores in his face. It drips from his body. Hematridrosis. The definition literally means One put under so much agony and pressure that it separates the water from the blood and besides water pouring out in your sweat glands, blood begins to drop down. He's not there some halfway prayer. Oh, let me preach to you right there. It ain't some two-second prayer before you go to bed or some halfway prayer, but he's there in agony and pain and so much pressure and so much pressure. He's bent over. He's got his face on the ground, and he's crying out to God, God, what is it? Lord, must I go this way? Is this what I have to do? So much pressure. Blood begins to run down his chin. Down his clothes, one drop after another. So much pressure, so much pressure, so much pressure. Why? He's in Gethsemane. What is Gethsemane? It's the olive press. And in that olive press, the will of God and the man, humanity, is pressing him and pressing him until blood begins to run from his pores. Jesus, do you got a choice? Yes. Could he have chose not to? Yes. Could he have chose another way? Yes. Can you choose other ways sometimes without taking the will of God? I'm talking about your humanity. How many times have we tried to bypass what we know was God's will? We know it's God's will. We know there ain't no way around it. But we come and we play with God sometimes and we toy with him when God's will ain't moving. And somewhere deep, somewhere deep within Jesus, he says, Father, watch the lamb. Watch the lamb. Not the priest. Not the high priest. Not the king. Watch the lamb. Son, watch the lamb. The lamb humbles himself. He says, Father, not my will. But thy will be done. Amen. Divinity has to give in to what humanity is asking. And humanity is asking for the Father's will. He fell on his face and prayed, saying, Father, watch the man. If it's possible. You know why? That sounds just like me and you. Lord, please, maybe there's another way. Maybe I can do this different. Maybe there's another way to handle this. Or as we do sometimes. Lord, I'll just put this on the back burner and just forget it for a little while. And the will of God ain't changed you. And he approaches the Father. And he's asking him, he's asking him. And what's God say? Nothing. God don't say nothing. What do you do when God don't say nothing? What do you do when God is silent? What do you do? You lay yourself at the Father's feet. Lord, this cup is bitter. This cup is hard. 
This could be tough. Maybe there's another will. Finally, he realized God ain't going to change his mind about his word. Amen. And he says, Lord, not my will, but thine. Amen. What do you do when God don't say nothing to you? I'll tell you what we do. We bounce off of the will of God and we start leaning on humanity, hoping humanity can bail us out. How many times have we depend on our humanity to bail us out of situations? And every time you try to lean on it, he fails you. Amen, somebody. Every time you sit in your recliner and pick your Bible up in your hand, you know what happens? Your humanity fails you. Whew, I don't like it, I know, because it's right where I live at. What happens when we lay down at night and we put on a tape and you fall asleep? Your humanity wins the war that night. Jesus is battling. He needs help, but there's no help. And he's pushed back and forth and back and forth, squeezing him, squeezing him. He goes from one to another to another until he's so pressed between them. Heaven seems like brass, and it seems like God ain't hearing one prayer from his lips. But the only thing he don't understand is, is God ain't saying nothing because his word ain't changed. And Jesus gets so pressed between humanity and divinity. It presses him so hard. This is the message this morning. It presses him so hard that out of the life of Jesus, one drip after another was oil comes dripping out of his life because he's so pressed in between there. He's, God's got his man. God's got humanity underneath his feet. And he presses him until oil begins to run out of Jesus' life. And that stream of oil runs from Gethsemane. It runs down to Pilate's Hall. And out of Pilate's Hall, it runs down those streets, down that Via Della Rosa. It runs outside the city to the town garbage dump. And it ends right there at Calvary. It's a stream of olive oil. How many believes that? God knows what you can take. God knows what he's got to put you through to get oil to run out of your life. Hallelujah. I'm glad God doesn't give us our way sometimes. I'm glad God don't answer all my prayers. Because some of my prayers are far-sighted or near-sighted. I'm not looking at it right. If humanity, if we can lean on humanity every time, we don't even need God. If we can depend on our flesh and our humanity and how good it is and how perfect, we don't even need a Calvary. But because every time I need him the most, he falls short every time. So God just keeps pressing me and pressing me and pressing me until he starts allowing that oil to flow out of my life. Listen, friends, when he was in the garden, he was there and Brother Bram said, the tempter come up before him. Saying, this is what you're going to get for giving your life to the Father. You mean this is what you're going to get out of it? How many times has the devil told you that? You mean this is what your life has done? You mean you lose a loved one in a car wreck? You, live your, you lose your loved one to a heart attack or something? This is what you're going to get out of it? You lose a loved one to disease? And this is what you get for serving God? Jesus, is this really what you deserve? All you have to do is ask and all of this leaves right now. And the tempter come up right before him. Just give in. You can't do this. You can't make this. You can't make a rapture. You can't be an overcomer. You can't go and, amen, somebody. Body change. You can't make a body change. If you'll just give in, this will all go away. This will all go away if you'll just give in. Just give in. Just give in. That's all you have to do. The tempter come before him. Is it fair? Is this really fair? Is this really fair that one man would die for everybody else? How fair is that? How fair is that? That you should have to do this for all humanity. Just say it. 
Just say it. And we'll take you out of the press. We'll take you out of it. And Jesus says, not my will. The will of humanity was to get out of it. The will of humanity was to find another way. But not my will, let thy will be done. Communion 1957, I'll hurry. That's exactly the way he does you and I. Just before the great battle of life starts, before the great battle of right and wrong, which begins to settle, battle within us, God brings us to a Gethsemane. God didn't spare his own son. He'll not spare us. You and I from the testing, and Jesus was confronting the greatest test that he ever had. Gethsemane laid just before him where that once and final sufficient test must come. When the birds of the entire world laid us on his shoulders. Brother Branham come to a place in his ministry to where he had to leave the Baptist church. And God was going to take that ministry and put the, the remember that the shuck actually had life in it at that time. And Brother Branham's ministry had to go through the shuck in order to produce the seed. So he goes to Mishawaka, and as he goes to Mishawaka, of course, he gets all the invitations, and he comes back to his wife, and he said, Honey, I found the cream of the crop. They're so excited about it. He's got invitations all over the United States. And she took and told her mother. And his mother-in-law said, I'll not have my daughter associated with such trash like that. Get out there and shake and jump around and possibly be in the spirit and talk in a different language. I'll not have my daughter around that trash. You don't know it, ma'am. But yes, they will. Brother Random says, honey, that's fine. That's fine. I won't worry about it. That's fine. I don't want to cause any problems. That's fine. The will of God was not going to move for that Malachi 4 ministry. The will of God was to go through the Pentecostal move. Amen, somebody. Had to be the restoration of gifts in order to bring the opening of the words. He had to go through Pentecost. And you've got to go through Pentecost too. Not denomination and experience. It is the will of God. The will of God wasn't going to move for Brother Branham. The will of God had to be done. This ain't a man's ministry. This is God's mouthpiece. It seems like everything calms down. Oh, that's fine. That's fine, honey. We won't go. We won't go. And Brother Ram comes to the place where a flood hits. God calls a flood to hit. And Brother Branham's going down them falls. Remember, down the cataracts. And he's trying to get that motor started. Remember? His wife and baby is there. And they pick him up. And they take him up north. He runs and tries to find them. He finds them finally in a hospital. They got meningitis and it's dying. He runs in there to find his wife. Remember Brother Ram said she'd come back too? And she said, Bill, I know we made our biggest mistake yet. We should have never listened to my mama. Promise me. Bill, you promise me. You'll go back and preach that Holy Ghost the rest of your life. What was it when she come back? She must have identified what happened to Mishawaka with something she seen on the other side. Uh, Lord of God. Amen. Mother Branham leaves his wife. She dies. His heart's tore out of his chest. 23 years old. She's 23 years old. But David, God would never do it. He'll put you where you're supposed to be at, whether you like it or not. 23 years old. She's dead. He goes to the doctor and says, where's my baby at? Billy, I hate to tell you this, but the baby's been feeding from its mama. It's attracted. That meningitis is well through its mama. You can't go see that baby, Billy. If you do, you'll track that to Billy Paul. He's already sick. Don't you do it. Doc, you don't understand. I've got to see my baby. I've got to see it. 
Doctor says, you can't. You just can't. Brother Ram said, remember he said, I went down the stairs down into that basement. He said, I got down there. He said, the screen was off the window. And flies had become matted around the baby's eyes. He said, I went down there and I picked that baby up in my arms. I'm looking at the baby. And the baby's drawled up under such intense pressure upon this baby. Why the baby do? What mistake did it ever do? Pain, suffering, agony. His body was drawn up under seizures of great pressure and pressure until finally Brother Ram looks at it and he said, those beautiful blue eyes, they used to smile at me. That blue eye under such pressure begins to turn in because the pressure is so, so hard upon the baby. Its eyes begin to cross. Brother Ram said, God, what are you doing? What are you doing to me? Why? Why? Lord, this is my baby. Amen. She's only nine months old. Please, God. Please. Is there another way? Is there another way, God? Is there a way around it? Please. Let this cup. Let this cup. Let it pass from me. Please, God, no. Anything but this. I want to raise this girl. I want to be raised her to be a young, beautiful young woman. You raise her to serve God. Please, anything but this. Amen. The baby's seizing up and seizing up and seizing up. Tried to serve you with everything I am. I tried to do everything I could for you. Would you let her call my people down there? Because a man bumped into the will of God, and God's will didn't move. So he went back and leaned upon humanity. And humanity led him down a road that could only bypass that will for so long until the submissive will would have to be brought back to the God's perfect will. There's no way around it. Happy Valley, there's no way around it. Abraham said, down on my knees with the doors closed, Father, there lays my wife, my baby's mother laying under the undertaker's more. Billy Paul's down the bed sick. Here's my baby dying. Surely, Lord, you won't take her. I love her. She resembles her mother. I want to raise her. Won't you please, oh God, spare my baby's life? Do you see the prayer? And I looked up, and you know, I've always been subject to visions. So when he sees this vision, he says, it seemed like a black sheet just rolled down and unfolded, coming down. And Brother Brown makes this statement. God throwed my prayer. God took my prayer and throwed it, it right back in my face. I've dealt with people like this. I know people today because they feel like their prayers got thrown back in their face. They leave this message and never serve God again. I know a man because they, they went through a divorce. Him and his wife divorced and it's been for now 30 something years. This man's never walked back in a church door because he blames God for his divorce. God takes your throw and throws it back in your face. Some people say that's it. I ain't serving him. He told it back in my face. What have I done, God? Have I transgressed your laws that I should have this punishment? Jesus, reveal it. I'll repent. I'll do anything, but don't take my baby. I've seen she was going anyhow, and I raised up. And the tempter came. And the tempter came. 
there was the one time in all my life that I can call was the crucial moment. Watch what he says. My Gethsemane. When I was just barely holding onto the bed, the devil said, there you are. Is that the reward for trying to serve him? Isn't this something how the devil can have such a good argument when you feel so low and so down and you're so sensitive that moment your feelings are running so, so sensitive to anything anybody says? That's what you're going to get. Is that really what you're going to get? You mean to tell me to take that 22-year-old mother and lay her young as a corpse in the morgue and take that precious baby of your own flesh and blood and slam your prayer right in your face? And you mean to tell me you're going to serve him after that? But Rem said, I was standing between two opinions. That's what he says. I was standing between two opinions. It had to be decided. I put my hand over on her little head. And I said, the Lord gave and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Do you know what it takes to say that? you know what it takes when you've got this baby that you've watched around the house crawl around the house as it was and it's around the house and you play with it in the mornings and you can't wait to hold it in the evenings and now the baby is under such cruciating pain it's died with its eyes crossed in your arms the Lord gives and the Lord takes away blessed be the name of the Lord I said Sherry honey daddy cannot go with you where you are now but daddy will come someday I'll lay you on the arms of your mother and I'll bury you. Daddy will see you again someday. The olive press between two opinions squeezed him and squeezed him until finally he gives in to the will of God because there was no way around it. Great things is birthed through much suffering. Much pain, much agony. Like Calvary, the oil, I like Gethsemane, the oil ran out and caused the Calvary. And because of this moment, out of this pressing of this olive, out of the crushing of this olive, came the message of the hour. See, friends, it has to be this way. Because God said he was going to have a bride without spot or wrinkle. God said he was going to have a people. And there's no other way but to press him until the oil run and the message was going to come forth. The world's greatest battleground. It ain't our shoutings. It ain't our glory to God. It's when we submit to the Father's will. And say, God, not my will, but thine be. How many times have you had your prayers thrown back in your face when you've asked God over and over again, please God, please God, anything God, anything but this, please, Lord, anything but this. How many times have you prayed about something and it looks like everything's going to be just fine, everything goes just fine, and then turns around and it throws back in your face and you're back at the starting point again. Say, God, I trusted you. God, I trusted you. I went through a situation just recently where I've been praying and praying earnestly before God, laying before him, thinking, man, this is going to be all right. This, this is going to come out. It's going to be okay to only find out a few days later. He failed. It's not going to come this time. You say, God, why? Amen. Lord, I drive home sometimes at night so tired that I find myself running off the road. Why is it I go and labor and pray for your children? Be honest, somebody. I pray, Lord, sometimes I preach and I ain't got no voice left. Why, God? How many times have you bumped into that will of God and you keep bumping into it and the will of God does not move? You may not understand this statement now, but you will one day. I'm so glad he don't move. I'm so glad he don't move. I'm glad he don't give in when I want him to give in every time. I'm glad he just don't give me my way every time I ask. I'm glad he presses me. Three years ago, I quit preaching. I left and I quit. I said, I ain't preaching to people no more. People on this message don't want to hear it. And I ain't preaching it. 
I'm tired of it. I'm done with it. I'm going to, I'm, I'm tell you, I got license. I work in the middle field. Forget it. I'm done. I went down and told one of my friends and said, I'm done preaching. I'm done. People don't care no more anyway. I'm finished with this thing. I want to find something else to do. I'm tired of it. I got abilities. I got degrees. I can do it. I'm sick of it. There's got to be another way. And my own friend puts me in that press. He says, no, you're not. You're going to quit crying and babying around. And you're going to go on the field and do what God called you to do. I thought you hateful, thank you. <laughs> you don't even know what I'm going through. You don't know what I feel right now. Wore out, tired, burn out. Tired of studying your life and giving your life. I give, I've been preaching since I was 16. Give all your use to it. Tired of it. No, you're not. You're going to go do what God told you to quit crying and babying around about it. And when humanity wouldn't give in and the will of God wouldn't change. You got a man the first day of September on Sunday preaching to you about a man that goes through an olive press. Let's stand to our feet this morning. God bless you. Oh, don't you just love him this morning? <laughs> Could we buy our hearts just for a second as our brothers come? Play something softly this morning. I would just like to challenge you while you sit in that pew this morning. You think this sermon is just by chance? I doubt it very seriously. God's got a reason why this was preached this morning. I don't know. You may not know your needs, know your problems. But I believe that God can bring something great out of your all of your life. It look beyond my faults and so my needs. I believe God can bring something good out of your life. It may not look like there's any way now. Don't give up on him, friends. Don't give up on him. Quit looking at your humanity and expecting your humanity to bail you out. Every time you get down, every time you go through a test, every time you got a little pressure. Listen, friends. It can only bail you out so long before it fails you. Look to the will of God. And just one time in your life, say, God, I'm tired of getting my way. I fail it to make a mess out of it every time. I want to give you your way, Lord. With our hearts bowed and our eyes closed, nobody looking around to see who's got a need and who don't. Well, if it's so much to you, I'll raise my hand with you this morning. Can anybody say, Brother David, I feel like I've been in that olive press. I feel like I've been in that Gethsemane. Maybe you've been there for a few months now. Maybe you've been there for a few weeks now and you're just needing an answer. you got something you need a God to answer it desperately. Friends, don't try to make a way around it. Just submit to him. Let him have his way. Let him get what he wants out of you. Oh, God, help us. Lord Jesus, we love you this morning, Lord. It tore my heart. Lord, it so put so much pressure on me when I read this week of your prophet saying, because of my mistakes, my wife lays yonder in a graveyard. Because of my mistakes. He was so pressed. Lord Jesus. I come before you this morning. Lord as humble as we know how. I bring this congregation before your throne Lord. And I ask you Father. Let your will be done. Lord God don't let me just have. A way around it to make it easier. I know Lord that's the way that all of us would have. Nobody wants to choose the harder way. Lord, as the man interpreted in French, the prophecy came forth and told Brother Brown, because you have chosen the harder way, there's a great portion of heaven that awaits thee. I trust, Father, may we follow in the same footsteps this morning. Help us to be able to surrender ourselves. I can't believe after all these years of serving you, We'd be praying a prayer like this. Help me to surrender me before your throne, Lord. 
I need to learn it. I know I do. I complain too much. I argue with you too much. I ask too many questions. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive you, church, this morning. Search our hearts, Father. We lay all of our needs and petitions before you. You know every hand, and you know every need in their every hand and in every heart. And I'm asking you, Lord, I don't know where they're at, but maybe there's some this morning that's in that press. Maybe they're in that valley decision. And they try to lean upon humanity and it fails. And they go back to the will of God and it won't move. You're pressing this for a reason. You're wanting to bring the oil out of our lives. Help me to surrender to you, Lord. And each one this morning, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. You appreciate the grace of God in your life. Could we sing this together? Oh, my. Larry, would you? Amazing Hallelujah. Grace Won't you just close your eyes? Shall Let him speak to you this morning. Be my song of praise. Yes, praise. For it was grace. It's always been grace. That bought my liberty. Just why he came to love me so. He looked beyond all my faults and saw my need. I shall Where my Jesus 
And the times may bring me sunny days on close or distant shore. Oh, but I want what you want for me. Humanity does. Whatever. 
sisters when all the oil has been squeezed from our lives and God puts us where he wants us to be at that's right in the center of the will of God I believe with all of my heart one day this would be more than just a song more than words that's said across the PA one day it'll become a reality after everything you've been through in life all the troubles all the trials all the tests God's going to make something great out of us because of a victory in the garden Oh, God, there's going to be another garden we're going to enter into one day. Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years. Not with a log chain, but bound with chains of circumstance. He ain't going to have nobody to work through. And at that garden, there'll be no more press. There'll be no more squeeze. There'll be no more grapes being crushed, olives being crushed. At that garden, there'll be glory to God. There'll be shouting. There'll be singing. There'll be singing on the hills of glory. Oh, I long for that day. One day, all of our problems and troubles will take a back seat. Yeah. Hallelujah. But here you go. God the bless you. more I seek you, yes. the more I find you. Oh, God. Press me if you got to press me. The more I find you. Squeeze me, Lord, if you got to squeeze me. I'm not going to blame you. I'm not going to walk away. I'm going to keep pressing. I'm going to keep fighting, Lord. Hallelujah. I want to sit at your feet. Drink from the cup in in your your hand. hand. Lay back against you. Oh, I long for Lord God. Feel your heart beat. Oh, this This love love is so deep. It's more than I can understand. Oh, God, it's greater than me. Greater than I my humanity. Oh, worship it's Him this morning. Lord, your grace overwhelms me, Lord. Hallelujah. I seek you. Oh, I look for you, dear God, every morning, every day. The more I find you. Oh, tell me now. Worship Him, church. Love Him this morning. The more I find you. The more I find you. You're the lily of the valley. You're the bright, the morning star. You're my God. You're my King. You're my peace. You're my oil press. You're everything I have need of this morning, Lord. I call out to you, Lord. I want to sit at your feet, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise our God. Praise our God. Praise our God. And the more, the more I I find find you, this is what I like. The more oil I see, the more I I love you. you. Sing it now, one more time, on your heart. I wanna sit at your feet. Oh, you can be better now. Drink from this cup in your hand. Lay back against you. I wanna hear your heart beat, Daddy. I wanna feel your love. I want to see your will greater. This I want to see your word greater. So it's my desire today, it's Lord. I, I want to get closer. Draw me near today, Lord. Draw me near, oh, peace. It's overwhelming. Oh, I want to sit at your feet. Drink from this cup in your hand. Lay back against you and breathe. Feel your heart beat. This more than I can understand I rest in your peace it's
It's overwhelming. 